ಪಾರ್ಥಿವಾರ್ಧವಾ ಕುಂಜಾಧಿಹಾರಿ ಜಾಮ್ ವಿಷ್ಣು ಪಾದ ಪರಮಂಸ ಪರ್ವಾಜಕಚಾರ್ಯ ಆಸ್ತ ಥರ್ಸತ ಶಿಶಿಮಾರಿ ಇಸ್ ಡಿವೈನ್ ಗ್ರೇಸ್ ಎ ಸಿ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಪ್ರಭಾರ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ಜಾಮ್ ವಿಷ್ಣು ಪಾದ ಪರಮಂಸ ಪರ್ವಾಜಕಚಾರ್ಯ ಆಸ್ತ ಥರ್ಸತ ಶಿಶಿಮಾರಿ ಶೃಂಗ ಗುರು ಶಿಲಿ ಭಕ್ತಿ ಸದಾಂತ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ಕೋ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಮಾರ್ಜ್ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ಅನಾಥಿ ಕೋರಿ ವೈಷ್ಣವಿಂದ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ಇಸ್ಕಾನ್ ಬಿ ಬಿ ಟಿ ಫೌಂಡರ್ ಚಾರ್ಯ ಶಿಲ ಪ್ರಭಾರ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ನಾಮಚಾರ್ಯ ಶಿಲ ಹರಿದಾಸ್ ಠಾಕೂರ್ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ಪ್ರಮಸಕೋ ಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅರ್ವೇತ ಗದಾಧಾರ ಶಿವ ಸರಿ ಗೋರ್ ಭಕ್ತವಿಂದ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಶ್ರೀ ರಾಧ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಗೋಪಿ ಗೋಪಿನಾಥ ಶ್ಯಾಮಕುಂಡ್ ರಾಧಕುಂಡ್ ಗಿರಿ ಗೋವರ್ಧಾನ್ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ಬೃಂದಾವನ ಧಾಮ್ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ಮಾಯಪುರ ಧಾಮ್ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ನವದೀಪ್ ಧಾಮ್ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ಜಗನಪುರಿ ಧಾಮ್ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ನೋ ದ್ವಾರಕ ಧಾಮ್ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ದರ್ ಡಿವೈನ್ ಲೋಡ್ ಶಿಪ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಶ್ರೀ ರುಕ್ಮಿಣಿ ದೋರ್ಕಡೀಶ್ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ದರ್ ಡಿವೈನ್ ಲೋಡ್ ಶಿಪ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಶ್ರೀ ಜಗನಾಥ್ ಪಾಲ್ದೇವ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಮಾತೆ ಸುಭದ್ರ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ದರ್ ಡಿವೈನ್ ಲೋಡ್ ಶಿಪ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಶ್ರೀ ಗೋಣಿಧಾಯ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ಗ್ರಂಥರಾಜ್ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಾಗವತಾಮ್ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ಜಮುನಮಾಯ ಗಂಗಮಾಯ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ಥೌಸಿ ದೇವಿ ಭಕ್ತಿ ದೇವಿ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸಿಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಬುಕ್ ಡಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿಬ್ಯೂಷನ್ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ಹರಿನಾಮ್ ಸಂಕೀರ್ತನ ಜಗ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸಿಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಪ್ರಸಾರಂ ಡಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿಬ್ಯೂಷನ್ ಕಿ ಜಾಯ್ ಗೋರ ಪ್ರಮಾನಂದ ಹರಿ ಹರಿ ಬೋ ಆಲ್ ಗ್ಲೋರಿಯಸ್ ಟು ದ ಸಮ ಡಿವೋರೀಸ್ ಹರಿ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಆಲ್ ಗ್ಲೋರಿಯಸ್ ಟು ದ ಸಮ ಡಿವೋರೀಸ್ ಹರಿ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಆಲ್ ಗ್ಲೋರಿಯಸ್ ಟು ದ ಸಮ ಡಿವೋರೀಸ್ ಹರಿ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಆಲ್ ಗ್ಲೋರಿಯಸ್ ಆಲ್ ಗ್ಲೋರಿಯಸ್ ಟು ಶ್ರೀ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರು ಅಂಡ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಗೋ ರಾಂಗ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ So today we're reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam. This is the third canal, chapter 23, The Lamentation of Devahuti. We're on text 19 to 21. So I'll, re- I'll read text 19 and 20, and then we'll chant text 21 together. Okay. So today's class is about God gifted. Are you? God gifted There's a nice quote I think that um uh, kind of summarizes or encapsulates this chapter What is the what is difficult to achieve for determined men who have taken refuge of the supreme personality of God at its lotus feet His feet are the source of sacred rivers like the Ganges which put an end to the dangers of mundane life <coughs> So dear devotees this uh 23rd chapter of the Shrimad Bhagavatam it's going to offer a profound message that will challenge us to examine what it means to be truly alive and to consider the gifts God has bestowed upon us being God gifted it's not just about extraordinary talents or abilities but also about recognizing that the greatest gift is the opportunity to realize our spiritual nature and develop our loving relationship with Krishna. So let's dive into it. I'll chant this. Chakshusmat parmaragagriyar rajrabitishu nirmitai justam vichitra vaitanar maharar hematodanai this one translation <coughs> and purport with the choicest rubies set in its diamond walls it appeared as though possessed of eyes it was furnished with wonderful canopies and greatly valuable gates of gold is it okay yeah a purport artistic jewelry and decorations 
giving the appearance of eyes are not imaginary. Even in recent times, the Mongol emperors constructed their palaces with decorations of jeweled birds with eyes made of valuable stones. The stones have been taken away by the authorities, but the decorations are still present in some of the castles constructed by the Mongol emperors in New Delhi. So we're going to show that a little bit. The royal palaces were built with jewels and rare stones resembling eyes, and thus at night they would give off reflective light without need of lamps. So text 20. Hamsa paravatta vratais tatra tatra nikujitam kritiman manyaman aiswan aruhu ya ya cha. Translation Here and there in that palace were multitudes of live swans and pigeons, as well as artificial swans and pigeons, so lifelike that the real swans rose above them again and again, thinking them live birds like themselves. Thus the palace vibrated with the sounds of these birds. Imagine, beautiful. Okay, so let's chant this together. <clears throat> Vihara stana vishrama Samvesha prangana guyai Yato pajo samrachitar Vishma panam ivatmanai Vihara stana vishrama Sambesha prangana jirai Yato pajo samrachitar Vishma panam ivatmanaha Vihara stana vishrama Samvesha prangana jirai Yato bajo samrachitar Vishma panam vivatmanai Vishrama <clears throat> Sambesha Prangani Jirai Yato Bajo Samrachitar Vishma Pana Mivatmanaha Vihara Stana Vishrama Sambesha Prangana Jirai Ato bajo samrachitar Vishma pana mi vatmana Vihara stana vishrama Samhisha pananga jirai Ato bajo samrachitar Vishma pana mi vatmana Vaishnavis Vihara stana vishrama Sambesha panganja jirai Tobantanta nirachi star Vishma pana mi vatmanaha
Viharastana Pleasure Grounds Vishrama Resting Chambers Sambesha Bedrooms Prangana Inner Yards Ajirai With Outer Yards Yata upajosam, according to comfort. Rachitai, which were designed. Vishmapanam, causing astonishment. Eva, indeed. Atmana, to himself, Kardama. Translation and purport by Srila Prabhupada. The castle had pleasure grounds, resting chambers, bedrooms, and inner and outer yards designed with an eye to comfort. All this caused astonishment to the sage himself. Purport. Kardama Muni, being a saintly person, was living in a humble hermitage but when he saw the palace constructed by his yogic powers, which was full of resting rooms, rooms for sex enjoyment, and inner and outer yards, he himself was astonished. That is the way of a God-gifted person. So that's a that word in the beginning, God-gifted person. A devotee like Kardama Muni exhibited such opulence by his yogic power at the request of his wife. But when the opulence was produced, he himself could not understand how such manifestations could be possible. When a yogi's power is exhibited, the yogi himself is sometimes astonished. Jai. Om Gyana Timananda Shyagyana Jana Svakaya Chaksu Sunmaditamina Tasmai Shri Gurve Nama Shri Chaitanya Manubhistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayama Bhagadamayam Tadati Swapadantikam Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasari Gaur Bhaktivinoda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Vanchakopa Tribhishtra Kripa Sindhu Bevacha Patitanam Pavine Pyo Vaishnava Pyo Namo Namaha So let's do the translations one more time With the choicest rubies set in diamond walls It appeared as though possessed of eyes it was furnished with wonderful canopies and greatly valuable gates of gold. Here and there in that palace were multitudes of live swans and pigeons, as well as artificial swans and pigeons, so lifelike that the real swans rose above them again and again, thinking them live birds like themselves. Thus the palace vibrated with the sounds of these birds. The castle had pleasure grounds, resting chambers, bedrooms and inner and outer yards designed with an eye to comfort. All this caused astonishment to the sage himself. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? So this is the Srimad Bhagavatam. Actually, Bhagavatam is considered the topmost authority amongst Vedic literatures, and it's the essence of all scriptures. You know, these 12 cantos, they actually represent the bodily limbs of Krishna, and each canto focusing on a specific topic. So God has gifted himself in the form of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So we're on the third and the fourth cantos here. So this is the section we're at right now. And there's a nice prayer in regard to this from the Padma Purana. Of course, all these different cantos that represent his body, like the uh, first cantos are like his feet, the third canto are his, and fourth canto are his thighs, 
The fifth canto is his navel. The sixth canto is his chest. The seventh and eighth cantos are his arms. And the ninth canto is his throat. The tenth canto is his beautiful lotus face. And the eleventh canto is his forehead. And the twelfth canto is his head. So this prayer. I bow down to that Lord, the ocean of mercy, whose color is like that of a tamal tree, and who appears in this world for the welfare of all. I worship him as the bridge for crossing the unfathomable ocean of material existence. The Bhagavatam has appeared as his very self. Can you imagine? That's amazing. So uh, <clears throat> in the third and to the fifth cantos, it's going to describe creation, the planetary systems, their positions, and stories of devotees. And all these correspond to the different, uh, you know, bodies of Krishna. Of course, in all the different cantos, it describes ten topics. There's a nice verse that describes all of them. is Atra sargo visargas cha stanam poshanam utaya manvantare sanu kata nirodha muktir ashraya. So it goes from the universal creation to secondary all the way to liberation and the supreme shelter, Ashraya. So, actually all the aspects of knowledge that are important to human beings, they're summarized in these ten categories. And they're described at various degrees of emphasis and analysis throughout the Srimad Bhagavatam. So all these topics, they spread throughout the Bhagavatam. And each of these topics are more vividly described in various cantos. And since the Bhagavatam is non-different from Krishna, just as one takes darshan of the deity, gradually from his lotus feet we should look at Krishna like we look at the deity from the lotus feet, we go up. So similarly, Prabhupada emphasized that he says, uh, the only qualification one needs to study this great book of transcendental knowledge is to proceed step by step cautiously and not jump forward haphazardly as with an ordinary book. It should be gone through chapter by chapter, one after another. So that's essential for us to study these books. So now we're entering into the third canto. So Krishna has gifted himself as the Bhagavatam. And he also appears within it as Lord Kapila Dev and other incarnations. So it's amazing. Krishna is giving so many gifts. So just to give you a little overview here. So we're in this 23rd chapter. And in text 13 to 48, this is where Devahuti and Kardamuni enjoy and give birth to nine daughters. So and then the texts start from 13 to 21, it shows the descriptions of the beautiful aerial mansion. And it even astonishes Kardamamuni. So that's where we are now. And then it's going to show how Devahuti, she entered this beautiful lake and she became very, very beautiful. And then it shows how they traveled and enjoyed through the, in their aerial mansion. And then after returning, they both united and nine daughters were born. So here we're just going to cover a few of these and maybe some parts of the entire chapter. So it's very nice. So we, we'll see how there's so many jewels being described and so many things and how they enjoyed. But you know, at a deeper level, this uh, story conveys spiritual truths. See, the devotee's transformation from an austere, aesthetic life, you know, like Kardamoni and Devahuti, who's a beautiful queen, she lost all that luster, then it comes back. So it represents the soul's journey to its original pure state. And ultimately, these pastimes, they point to the reality beyond this material world. So there's another summarizing verse, that association for sense gratification is certainly the path of bondage. But the same type of association performed with a saintly person leads to the path of liberation even if performed without knowledge. So you see the mercy of the devotees going out and giving their association. So here Prabhupada mentions in the purport 
that he said that uh, in, even in recent times, the Mongol emperors constructed their palaces with decorations of jeweled birds, with eyes made of valuable stones. And, but the stones, they won't, you won't see them anymore. They've either been taken away by the authorities or people stealing them. <clears throat> but the decorations are still there. They're still present. And it shows, it's, it's so beautiful. Uh, who has been to the Red Fort? Anyone here? Wow, we have a few people. Is it amazing or no? Is it nice? Just so-so? <laughs> yeah, so that's nice. But actually, it's, uh, it was built by Shah Jahan in the mid-17th century. And it remains a major tourist attraction. And there's this, uh, this fort has actually been designated as what they call UNESCO. It's a United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. So it's, uh, it's considered to be that. So they're trying to, you know, restore all these historical places and keep them. But it's massive. It's like the walls, they stand 75 feet, you know, and they enclose a complex of palaces, entertainment halls, projection bal balconies. They have baths, indoor canals, geometrical gardens, as well as an ornate mosque. So it's very beautiful there. And then here's a few more images to show what it looks like. So as the richest, one of the richest rulers in the 17th century was at Shah Jahan's home and office. It was this magnificent red fort. So he had many marble edifices. He had decorations of silk, gold, a lot of mirror work. So it's reached its cultural apex at that time. But then at that same time, that's when it eventually collapsed and it was, they were driven out by the British. So you just see all these great gifts or great, you know, things we create, they're eventually, you know, they're destroyed or they're, we lose them in somehow or another. This is the material energy. And here's some other beautiful structures from around the world in different cultures. Just imagine how beautiful, these are just the ceilings and showing some of the chandeliers. And just imagine, as, as it's described in the Bhagavatam, that they're all made of gems, diamond, walls, gold, etc. Just imagine the opulence, and that's what Cardamoni created just by his mystic abilities. So it's described as a metaphor. It's like, you know, Cardamoni's palace was dazzling with jewels. And it's likened to the moon surrounded by stars in the night sky. And also, Alkard Mamuni and Devahuti were described in the same way. <clears throat> he was like the moon and Devahuti and all the, the women he created were like stars in the night sky. So it's beautiful. So here's another image just to kind of give us an idea. The grandeur of the place. So it's a digital image, but trying to develop and show that there's jewels and gems within the walls and showing some swans that were just created, you know, probably made out of marble, you could see. So, and they show that these, these places had s multiple stories, very sophisticated decorations. So this is amazing. <clears throat> Such luxurious amenities. And there's another one, you can see some of the diamond, you know, inlays in the walls there and some more birds. Like I said, it had indoor and outdoor areas like gardens. So I guess you could imagine there was an opening space in this particular section of a palace. So it's very beautiful. And then here we could see, as described, palaces with decorations of jeweled birds with eyes made of valuable jewels. Didn't they make deities out of jewels also? I think in the past, right? Can you imagine a deity out of all these precious jewels? It'd be amazing. So, but yeah, it's, uh, but we, we see we like to imitate the beauty of nature and use all the opulences to describe things and things like that. So the nature of birds. But we shouldn't imitate birds because they have a bird brain, right? So we could just see here, check this out. This happened right in front of the BBT. There's this bird here. 
talking about birds and a bird brain. So just see the attraction to the reflection we have of ourselves and things in the and places in the material world. And why are we attracted to Krishna? Because we're covered by Maya. We're distracted by material objects, lust, anger, greed, and we're unaware of our glories, you know. But first we try to see him through our eyes, through the deity, so many things. And because we don't reciprocate with him, we don't interact with him. So Krishna's, our Prabhupada's given us the ability of these deities so that we can interact and develop our love for him. So Archita knows this, right? Because he covered his mirror with a plastic bag. Because <laughs> they really mess up your mirror and your side of your car. So it's interesting, in the same third canto, we heard a story which is very contrasting to this one. We see Diti, she was unsubmissive to get something. She actually forced the arrangement. And what was the result of that? Demons. They destroyed and harassed the universe. <laughs> and then co contrast that to Devahuti. She was very submissive to serve. She let her husband make all the arrangements and just see what she got. Nine daughters, they populated the universe. They, they married all these great sages. And also she had, the, they, they manifested the Supreme Personality of Godhead as their son, Lord Kapila, and he enlightened the universe. So Prabhupada emphasized, as we see her, she was very submissive to serve. And Prabhupada emphasized that the most important part of one's spiritual name is Das. Because one time he heard devotees were saying, oh, my name's better than yours, actually, you know. And no, my name's better. <laughs> and they're like, and Prabhupada heard and he goes, oh. He said, the most important part of your name is Das, which means servant. So that establishes our identity as an eternal servant of Krishna. So unless our identity is firmly fixed as an eternal servant of Krishna, and his devotees, then our intention to serve will not be consistent. And when your identity as Krishna's servant is clear, then you're properly guided, your thoughts are guided, your words, your actions are in alignment with devotional service. So taking the shelter of spiritual names helps, you know, transforms our identity from a materialistic person to a devoted servant of Krishna, which facilitates progress in our Krishna consciousness. So that's an amazing thing. In the same canto, we see two opposite extremes. And there's another metaphor which Devahuti served her husband in Kardamuni with such great love and intimacy and respect, just as Parvati serves Lord Shiva. And that's, you know, comparing Devahuti's service to Parvati's service of Lord Shiva to show the ideal of a chaste and faithful wife. So the practical lessons we see that we learned Devahuti's example is the importance of cultivating a spirit of loving service, patience, and compromise within a marriage, while also maintaining our own spiritual growth and progress. So it's not like the wife needs to be, you know, subservient, but she can be a pillar of strength and support for the husband's spiritual and material well-being. So there's so many things that, you know, you get based on your genuine care and respect. And that's what Devahuti showed by example. So the key is that we have to adapt these timeless principles in our own circumstances. And the goal of marriage is centered on shared spiritual aspiration and selfless care for one another. So this is what Devahuti got, this fabulous castle that Kardamuni created for her using his mystic yogic powers. And it's described a marvelous castle that the yogi himself was astonished at what he had created. So this is a very lavish vision, an opulent palace. It suddenly appeared in the sky and it had fantastical, mystical-like qualities. And it allows us to just read that and visualize and just become amazed at the abilities that, we ha that are there. So just see, so then uh, Cardinal Muni, it was described, he was so absorbed in his meditation and his devotion that he practically forgot that he had a wife. 
But Devahuti accepted the life of her husband and she became emaciated, matted hair, wearing tree bark. And Kardamamuni took compassion on her and he rewarded her. And then when Devahuti, she dove into this lake Bindu Sarovra, which contains sacred waters from the Saraswati, she found a house inside the lake and where there was 1,000 youthful girls presented themselves for her maid servant. And then they brought her valuable oils and ointments, fine new clothes. They decorated her with very excellent jewels and a mirror. You can see she beheld a reflection and she saw that she was completely free of dirt and decorated with a flower garland. So just see. So it's for a purpose to become beautiful for her husband to serve, you know, in their particular ashram. So this is what we should be attracted to, not so much our own reflections, like the bird, the bird brain, but actually to be attracted to Krishna. There's an image actually I should have put in here was Krishna, he's looking at his own image on the, the floor of, of the palace is reflective like a mirror from the gems. And he was so astonished at looking at himself. So even Krishna is attracted. So why should we <laughs> not be attracted? So this is nice. So we can see there's a metaphor that of Devahuti. You can imagine this is just a digital representation of her lovely eyes are, are said to be compared to lotus petals. You see? So Devahuti's transformation from an austere ascetic to a beautiful queen, it represents the soul's return to its original pure state. And then Kardamuni and Devahuti's sensual enjoyment in the palace and heavenly gardens. It symbolizes spiritual bliss and experience when the soul reconnects with the divine. So Kardamamuni's ability to expand into nine forms to satisfy Devahuti's desire for children, it demonstrates the creative power of yogic abilities. So we should see that it's not merely sensual pleasure, but it's a representation of divine love and how the opulence described is like a, a metaphor for trying to imagine what the spiritual world is like. It's actually far more beautiful and eternal than any material creation. And then Kardamamuni's ability to grant Devahuti's desire reflects, reflects the idea that a true yogi or devotee can fulfill others' spiritual aspirations. So we see this, we had a vivid description of what's happening here in the great opulence and the journey of Devahuti. And it's interesting, so as she states one thing, after they enjoyed so much, this is something she said, she stated a concept of being dead, though breathing. And this is in this chapter. And I think it encapsulates <clears throat> the key message of the importance of this chapter. This is what she said. <clears throat> Anyone whose work is not meant to elevate him to religious life, anyone whose religious ritualistic performances do not raise him to renunciation, and anyone situated in renunciation does not lead him to devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, must be considered dead, although breathing. That's a powerful statement. So that's, you know, that's found. We could see that. <clears throat> and this is what this chapter is illustrating get into these realizations. So we can see this as uh, being described here, this, the essence of this chapter, that the message that the true life and the fulfillment can only be found in the pursuit of spiritual awakening and devotional service to Krishna. So without this higher purpose, our existence is no better than being dead, even though we're physically present and breathing. So this is like a wake-up call for all spiritual seekers so that we can prioritize our spiritual growth and seek guidance of enlightened spiritual teachers. They can help us navigate this path of self-realization. So we see this is a, another metaphor about the nine daughters. They're described as charming in every limb and fragrant like red lotus flowers. Just imagine. Devahuti gave birth to nine daughters and later to Kapiladev. 
an incarnation of Krishna, and who taught her the philosophy of Sankhya to help her attain liberation. So just see, Kardama Muni not only was able to gift things and places, as we saw, but real personalities. What a gift to society and to the universe. So this is interesting. <clears throat> so Kardama Muni, uh, he was, after this, they had these nine daughters, he realized that it now is the time to renounce the world and take up the path of spiritual devotion. So she, was, she knew that and she, she asked for, please then grant me freedom from fear. So this is her concern. And it was on a deeper level that Devahuti's plea for freedom from fear, it represented her yearning for liberation from the fund fundamental anxieties and insecurities that plague the material existence. So in the Vedic tradition, it's uh, understood that the root cause of all fear is the soul's identification with the temporary material body. You see, and it's re attachment to worldly pleasures and, and relationships. <clears throat> so she's asking for this guidance. So Cardamone responds and he offers it to her. You know, it's one of the real treasures that he was able to give to his wife and helping her. So this shows us that fearlessness is not achieved through material means such as wealth, power, social status, but through spiritual realization and surrender to the divine. And then we get free from all these anxieties and fears in this material world. So we see after fulfilling his householder duties, Cardinal Muni was ready to leave. <clears throat> and the story shows that even a perfect yogi like Cardinal Muni, he executed his prescribed duties as a householder, and then he went to the, the renounced order. So it shows the proper purpose and conduct of a household life. So this is interesting. So we might think, is this relevant today? You know, we could do this. So it's actually timeless wisdom. We should pursue on how, it's showing us how to pursue spiritual life through, you know, our situation and our responsibilities. And the goal is actually to develop love for Krishna. So we have to, it's crucial to understand how Kardama Muni, his creation and opulence was not the end in itself, but it was actually a means to a higher purpose. By providing Devahuti with the experience of material enjoyment and luxury, he was essentially allowing her to exhaust her material desires and attachments. And this was a necessary step in her spiritual growth. And it helped her eventually see the limitations and emptiness of worldly pleasures. But it's not that we have to go through that in order to become renounced. But actually, if we're intelligent, we can read these stories and glean from these how we should act. So, yeah. So she understood that. <clears throat> so we should take advantage of spiritual association and practice bhakti yoga. So basically, as we mentioned, this 23rd chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam it reminds us that we're all God gifted with potential to discover our eternal spiritual nature. And it's our responsibility to use our talents our resources to create products, gifts that uplift and inspire. You know, just like Cardinal Muni used his yogic powers to manifest a magnificent castle for his wife, nine daughters, and Kapila Day for the benefit of the world. So, and we're even getting the reaping of that result today. You know, they manifested the universe with living entities, the knowledge we can read about Kapila Day now. So we shouldn't waste our precious human lives on meaningless endeavors, like the bird trying to enter the mirror, or remain spiritually dead while physically breathing. So instead, let's seek guidance in genuine spiritual masters to dedicate ourselves to the path of self-realization, using our God-given gifts to serve the divine for the benefit of all beings. Jai. So I'd like to end there. Uh, do we take questions anymore? Or is there anybody have any comments or questions? Jai. Well, thank you for your kind attention.
All glories to Srimad Bhagavatam. All glories to Srila Prabhupada.